Okay, welcome um, everybody. Uh, we're going to begin today's uh, webinar. Um, so welcome to the webinar on record keeping. My name is Kara Maroney. I'm the Director of Professional Conduct. Um, I'll be running through the principles and requirements for record keeping in today's presentation. We also have with us John Gray, who is a member of Council and also owns his own practice here in Toronto. And he's here to provide us some real life examples and answer some of your uh, clinical and technical questions that will help bring to life those principles that I'll be talking about. Um, also today we have Ryan Pisana, our communications analyst. He's going to be moderating the session for us. Um, we actually hope to have more of these webinars in the future, but today we started with record keeping because it's definitely an area where practitioners have lots of questions, not just in this college, but in all of the colleges. It tends to be an area that members are very anxious about because there's lots of different requirements. It's, there's a lot of law that's involved. Um, and it's where you know there's a lot of accountability. So hopefully we can uh, ease your minds and answer a few of your questions. Okay, so we have identified seven principles, um, and we're going to go through each principle as we go along, and we'll break periodically for questions. Um, you can submit your questions at any time. We do have a lot of attendees that have signed up, and that's great to see that kind of engagement in the profession. We may not have, and we may not have time to get to everyone's questions. My contact information will be available at the end, and we will produce an FAQ fact sheet for this after the session and post it for your future reference. So I will be going through those seven principles. They're there for you. It's also important that not just to remember the principles, but it's also sometimes important to step back and remember why we keep records. Um, you don't just keep records because you have to, because someone told you to, because the law requires you to. And when you get into that kind of thinking, you can get really caught up in the technicalities or legalities, and that's where a lot of the anxiety sometimes happens. So if you take a step back and remember why we keep records, it can help answer some of your day-to-day -day questions. The most important thing about a record is it's to tell a story. It's telling the story of your patient or your client's health from beginning to end, from the time when they first started seeing you to the last time they saw you. It's also to allow for continuity of care between professionals. So if someone is treating your client or patient consecutively or concurrently, that if they want to look at your notes or you want to look at their notes, that you can understand what's going on. It's also there to provide recall and, for, and to allow you to know when you need to do a reassessment. Um, you may not see a client for six months, and then you may have many clients in between. So if you have something to go back and know exactly what the client was complaining of at that time, that's really going to help you. Sometimes clients aren't going to report the same thing six months later that they did to you six months before, and you may not remember exactly what they said. So that's really important as well. And of course, there is the accountability piece. This is your accountability, it's your accountability to your client, it's your accountability to make sure that the treatment is effective, and it's accountability for the whole entire healthcare system. It allows us to see if on an individual level we're working. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that there's a group of colleges that are actually working together, and that includes this college, to create an interpretive guide to, for those practitioners who are working with other practitioners in, in multidisciplinary settings where to help you understand how the different standards work together. And you can look for that probably around October as well. So it's um, ourselves, chiropractors, physiotherapists, and at three other colleges. Okay, so the first principle that we have up here is that records must be identifiable. You must be able to identify the client. You must be able to identify the person making the entry. You need to identify, and that ties into signatures. Um, you, they have to be legible, and if someone in your clinic has the same initials as you, you have to be able to know which practitioner it was that actually made that charting entry. And you have to be able to identify each and every page with the client. So if you take a file out of a drawer and it falls apart, you have to be able to put it back together again in sequence. So however you want to do that. Um, a note on client identifier. Uh, our standard does 
specify uh, that you will identify the client with, I believe, name, address, and gender. I did want to say that that can vary. So don't get too caught up in the word will, W-I-L-L, -L, because the point is, is that it has to be unique. Um, and some clients don't have a fixed address. For instance, if you're working in public health, or um, some clients may not identify as male or female. Uh, there's an increasing awareness of transgender, and I know some people think this isn't uh, this is a rarity. But if you work in bigger centers, you might be presented with this. So don't get too caught up in the will. Just make sure that it's something that's unique to that client. I'm just stopping to see if there's any questions about identification. Okay, the next, the next principle we have is that your records must be comprehensive. Um, our standard does provide a list of what should be included, and I've provided some of those up on this slide. And there's also a record keeping checklist that we do provide on our website. So we're going to show you where to get to that right now. You'll go onto our web page, the home page. You'll see at the bottom there's some green boxes. You'll click on standards and guidelines. And you'll see under standards, you'll see our record keeping standard. And then next to it, you'll see the record keeping checklist. So that is there for you. Um, my one caution with checklists is don't rely on them too much. Remember to take a step back to those principles and why we keep records. And sometimes the checklist doesn't include everything, or it includes something that you don't, you don't need. So it's, it's there as a guide, but it's not there as the definitive be all and end all for what, what happens in the records. Um, so I'm going to stop because I know we have some, this tends to be an area of a concern with members, like what do I document, what do I not document, uh, what types of formats do we use. Um, we did have a question from Janice about are there examples of acceptable notes. Um, we wouldn't really put an example note on our website. But I'm going to let John speak to some of the formats that he uses and examples of what he might include in a note. So I'll hand it over to John. Thanks, Kara. <coughs> so uh, just to clarify, <coughs> the, the population I work with are uh, generally active adults. Uh, and they come to me with any uh, acute or chronic illness or injury, a lot of post-surgical work, et cetera. And so um, the best format that I've found that works for my practice is a typical soap note. Uh, it also works well because I, I do work closely with other health professionals and also in, in a very busy downtown clinic um, where there are physiotherapists, massage therapists, and others. And so uh, it helps when you can communicate using the same format uh, if and when you need to communicate on, on a given uh, client. So uh, as I mentioned, I, I use a soap note SOAP note format, and if you're unfamiliar with them, SOAP stands for uh, subjective, which would be what your client or patient is telling you at the time, uh, their history, what happened since the last treatment, for example. Uh, o is for objective. It comes down to what you observe. Uh, and in my case, I use objective also for any tests and measurements uh, that I take. Uh, the next one is assessment. Now, the other side of that is a lot of people will use their tests and measures in the assessment portion. Uh, in my case, uh, I prefer to uh, put my my kind of my my determination in terms of what I've information I've received from the client uh, added to what I've been able to see uh, objectively and do my measures and then decide on the appropriate approach. Uh, so you could also say A would be uh, approach as well as assessment. P would be the plan, like how are you actually going to carry this whole thing out? And it also relates to the treatments that you may uh, provide, even if it's, for example, um, rest. Yeah, sometimes you get somebody in if they're quite uh, irritated, uh, if an, an area is inflamed, perhaps doing something active. Probably the best thing to do for them is to give them an opportunity to just allow that to quiet down. It may be any uh, number of things. Now, this all originated from the medical community uh, and a lot of and nursing in particular. And an older system, which apparently is still being used, is called it's an extension of this called the SOAPY note, uh, and uh, it adds I and E on the end of it. 
Um, I would stand for implement, which is a list of what you would, what you've done to that point, and E would be an evaluation in terms of at the end of a treatment program. Uh, but the important thing is that A, you stay consistent, and B, you don't necessarily have to include every section uh, with every note. If you have things that are carrying forward, so for example, if you have a list of exercises and the person just needs reinforcement on certain exercises, there's really not any point in making a, um, an additional note in that, in that area. Um, the other thing is kind of interesting is you may may decide that soap notes don't necessarily work for you, and anybody who works in an uh, occupational setting may decide on other headings that might work for them. They might have something for intervention. They might have something for specific measurements and tests. And they create their own acronym as long as it meets the guidelines and the standards of the college. Really, uh, there is no limitation to what you can use. Uh, it just has to be. You just have to be able to refer back and uh, uh, be able to answer all those those points that Kara had made earlier. Uh, thanks, John. That was that's very helpful. And I, as John raises a good point about consistency. Whatever model you do use, make it consistent. Um, there's also charting by exception that still exists. So, and it's it's reasonable, and it might change from from situation to situation. Um, so I think it's important to uh, when, when it comes to comprehensiveness, again, go back to your principles and go back to why are you keeping a record. Um, if you have a really, if you personally have a really bad memory, you may need to keep longer notes than someone who is maybe able to to re re recall patients a little bit better. Um, so those types of things, you have to think about what works for you, what works for the client. Charting should also be efficient. It, it, you know, we don't want it to take up hours and hours of your time so that you're not even spending time with your clients. So find what works for you and find um, what will meet the, meet the standard. And I've also noted that you also have to keep equipment records, daily appointment records, and financial records. We're not really going to touch on that today. Time doesn't allow for it. I just wanted to point it out that you do have those requirements. But today we're mostly dealing with what's going in the patient-client record. OK, so the next next principle is accuracy. And you can have the most comprehensive notes in the world, but if they're not accurate, they're not going to be any good to anybody. So it may seem obvious to state that ensure you get the proper, proper dates and names, um, proper names of the clients, of the client's family members. Um, who's providing care? Is it you? Is it a student? When you're billing, make sure your invoices are accurate. Make sure your times are accurate, especially with billing. It makes a difference whether you saw a client for half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, it's also, uh, where applicable, it's a really useful thing to use the client's own words. Um, so if, for instance, if a client reports that they have pins and needles sensation, write that down. Client reports pins and needles. Don't substitute client reports tingling or whatever the scientific term is for pins and needles, if there is one, client's own words. That way, if they, they come back to you and dispute that later on, you can say, well, this is what you reported to me at this time. So it helps with, it helps with the accountability portion. Um, so that's really important. Um, I'll move on to the... Um, we'll move on. We have another. We have a couple of questions that might tie into the next principle, which is legible and understandable. Um, so, so the next principle is legible and understandable. Um, all entries must be readable by anyone accessing them. So, I know that seems like it doesn't happen when we read our doctor's prescription notes, but. We should be able to read records, and if they're not readable, then you need to transcribe them for the person who's requesting them. Um, this may not be as much of an issue anymore with people, you know, electronically charting and they're typing. Although, just make sure that you know your spell check is working, or or that it's not doing autocorrect to words that actually aren't applicable, and then it's not understandable. And we do have some questions about um, electronic uh, record keeping. Um, 
we will get to that when we talk about security, but I, I wanted to just note that the principles and the requirements in the standard apply to both written or hard copy and electronic. So um, you have to have identifiable records, whether it's in paper or electronic form. So, um, but we will get to more about electronic records when we talk about security and confidentiality. Um, your records must be in English or French. And abbreviations or acronyms um, that aren't, you know, readily understandable by um, the public or the profession should be in a legend. So, um, BP for blood pressure, I would think most people would understand that. That's pretty understandable. But there's there's some that maybe are not as as understandable. I don't know, John. Do you have any examples of? We talked earlier about the hashtag, uh, which is really uh, finding its way on Twitter a lot. Uh, or the pound sign is used often to denote a fracture. So, um, uh, and we may do things like uh, identifying different areas of the spine, like um, lumbar, cervical, or thoracic, with a capital T followed by a small s or something like that. Those would be two abbreviations I use fairly often. Um, TKA. Total knee arthroplasty would be, you know, like a artificial knee. Uh, so TKA is a lot easier to spell out than arthroplasty. So it's, you know, whatever you can, um, you use that and then stick with the same abbreviation. Sometimes it's difficult when you're starting out, but having that that list of your uh, abbreviations at the front as well really helps you to uh, to speed up. Yeah, and I think if you're in a facility, check that the facility has a policy on that so that all the practitioners are using the same abbreviations and try not to come up with your own um, because that may, be, that may be problematic later on if someone's trying to read the record and you're not there. Um, I just, there was a comment, I'm just going to go back and answer one question about electronic records and can you comment on the signature? Um, your records need to be, going back to identifiable, um, you, with electronics obviously you don't sign, uh, you can, there's some systems that might allow you to actually sign electronically, but you just have to have something that identifies you as the person that entered that charting note. Um, and you can have security systems that you have to log in in order to chart so that you know that no one else can attest your initials to that charting note, so you may want to think about some security around that. So it doesn't actually need to be a signature like we sign on a check, but your notes have to identify that you were the maker of the note. Okay, so we're going to move on. Could we, would signatures also deal with, uh, could you scroll back Jocelyn's question? Sorry, we're just going to, we're looking over some of the questions here. Um, okay, we have a question from Jocelyn, and the question is, I work in a very multidisciplinary team, and I usually see the patient after they have seen a doctor. Is it okay to use their notes and document anything else I need or clarify anything I need? Do I have to re-ask, ask, re-document those pieces of information? Uh, a lot of times you may actually want to or be required to chart in the same um, the file that uh, that another professional is using, or another health professional who referred you that client, and it really comes down to um, the issue of payment more often than not. For example, there are going to be a lot of kinesiologists in the industry who are, uh, at least in some capacity, going to work as a physiotherapy assistant, and in doing so, they're going to be carrying out a physiotherapy treatment. They're not going to be specifically uh, providing a kinesiology treatment. So as a result of that distinction, um, the physiotherapist, in, in my example, is the one who's really going to be uh, in charge, so to speak, or supervising, supervising the treatment, uh, the delivery of the treatment. Uh, as a result, the physiotherapy assistant would be using the same chart make the notes, and if we refer back to the uh, SOAP notes, the one that they would likely omit would be any form of uh, assessment, because obviously the assessment's been made, and the supervising professional um, 
really has that as their responsibility uh, in terms of the best uh, the best approach for the client. So the physiotherapy assistant would make the notes and sign off on it at the bottom. It would then be, go back to the uh, supervising professional who would then sign off on that note after conferring with the, with the assistant uh, in that respect. So yes, if, if the person who sends you the client is still in charge of their care, it is likely that making entries into that same chart is fine, but you have to appreciate that that person's uh, the supervising health professional. If it's a direct referral across to you and you are uh, seeing them as a kinesiologist separate uh, as a result of your scope of practice being significantly different from who has uh, referred you that client, you'd be expect, expected to have a separate chart, a uh, separate file for that client and go through all the necessary uh, health uh, information forms and, and evaluation and assessments um, that would allow you to treat that person as best you could. Thanks, John. Um, you will note in the in the standard, it does say that you should document and keep records uh, reasonable information about any referral. So if you have a referral note from another practitioner, you should just insert that exact note into into the into the patient client record. Um, we're just going to break and uh, do another question from Richard, who asks. I work as an ergonomist, so my clients are employers. I typically do not review individuals. I typically review a job, not people. Do my field notes need to meet these standards? Um, I would say it's the best practice is yes to that question. You still have, um, even though your client, by way of probably a contract, is your employer, you are still Usually, from my understanding of ergonomics, is that you are providing a service to the employer to help the employees, um, you know, do their jobs better and make sure that they, you know, they're doing everything ergonomically correct. So you are, you are still providing, um, maybe a little bit indirectly, care to employees, and you need to be accountable for what your results are, um, because if you provide a report to the employer saying that they should implement these steps and a client complains to the employer later on saying this didn't work for me, you need to be able to go back to your field notes and say, well, this is what my assessment looked like, this is the criteria that I use, this is the framework and whatnot. So yes, you're a kinesiologist, you're a registered kinesiologist, you're working as a kinesiologist, you need to keep records and those records should meet should meet the, meet the standards. Obviously, again, we say reasonable because that's what changes, um, but you're still required, definitely. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next principle, and that is that records must be retrievable. And this means in both electronic and paper form, whichever is used. Um, sorry. Um, this is which being having your records retrievable is very important because it's important to remember that personal health information belongs to the client. You are just in con custody and control of their records. So, if they ask for their personal health information by way of their record, it's their right to get it, and it's their right to get it in a in a reasonable time frame. Um, so you you know to have your records retrievable and organized is very very important. Um, the Personal Health Information Protection Act, which is the act that would be you would be most dealing with, um, does set out some time limits for um, access requests, and I think you have 30 days. So th this is very very important, and they have to be retrievable through the retention period. I think we did have some questions about retention earlier on. Did we, Ryan? Um, the retention period for records is 10 years or if the after the date of their last visit. And if the client, if you saw a client for the last time when they were 16, let's say, it's 10 years past their 18th birthday. So it would be 12 years for that client. Um, and so it, it, you don't have to keep a client that you saw eight years ago. You don't have to keep their record in your clinic. You can um, you can store off-site. And 
I think John will, John's going to speak to his uh, storage in a minute when we get to the next, um, next slide. But you are permitted to organize your records, to, to put your records in off-site storage, but they must still be retrievable. So don't put them in some sketchy garage somewhere in the back covered with cobwebs where you got to dig a tunnel to get to them and then you get in there and they've been eaten or they're all out of order. You need to have them organized no matter where you put them. Do we have any questions about retrieve? Do you want to deal with the uh, notes uh, from uh, reports? Um, oh, okay. We'll go, um, well, we'll ask that, we'll answer that question on the end because I think it's, we'll move on to, we had a question from um, Alexander, and we'll we'll come to that about SAEs maybe at the end of the presentation, and I'll I'll move forward through the next principle, or the next two principles, the last two, which are records must be secure and confidential. This is where we really get into legis wonderful law and legalities, um, which for myself as a lawyer, I don't I don't mind, but I know for a lot of people, it's where they get really really anxious. There is a practice guideline on our website that speaks directly to PHIPA. The Privacy Commissioner website has a ton of resources. You can call them up if you have questions about different things. Um, they have fact sheets on how to encrypt Gmail, for instance, or how to assess your um, how to assess your technical uh, what you have in place to secure your records on a technical basis. Um, the important thing to remember with, with PHIPAA, the most important thing, is it speaks to the duties of a health information custodian. Um, and a health information custodian is a person or an organization that has custody or control of personal health information. And then there's also agents who are defined as someone who acts on or behalf of the HIC with the HIC's authorization. So when I say HIC, I mean health information custodian. Um, the most common uh, instance of a health information custodian is if you're a sole practitioner or if you own your own clinic. So John, he owns his clinic. He is the health information custodian. If he has employees, people that he employs directly, they are his agents. So they are, they are responsible for keeping everything confidential. But John has duties over and above that. And in the act, it will speak to all those all those duties and you it's things like you have to ensure that there's security and that you deal with all the access requests that you have a contact person to make access requests that you have a privacy policy that's available for your patients and clients that you're monitoring your systems continually that's all the HIC's um, uh, duties and whatnot so we can get more into that or you can email me your specific questions afterwards and just a note on security and confidentiality and, and PHIPAA. Again, I know PHIPAA is a long piece of legislation. Legislation is not the easiest documents to read on the best of days. Um, and it sets out a lot of re technical requirements. Sometimes it doesn't tell us how. But I just wanted to also bring this back to the idea of, you know, don't get caught up in the legalities. Privacy and confidentiality are very, very important. It's a, it's a right of every person in a free and democratic society that they have a right to privacy and health information is one of our most private things that we have. So don't just think of it as a technical requirement, I have to keep things confidential because I'm not allowed to disclose. Try to remember it on that personal level. It's, it's really, really important for people to know that they can talk to you in confidence and know that their, their information is going to be safe. Okay, so we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about security. And um, we do have a question about, can I leave my client's records at their house if that is where I'm seeing them? Uh, PHIPA specifically um, says that you can keep records at a client's house as long as you know that they are safe and secure. Um, and you, you should have the client's consent to do that as well. And so you need to make sure that they have a proper place where they can be kept, that they may not be accessed by anyone else. Remember that even in a, in a home, 
a person may want their personal health information private from other family members. So if you're going to leave a record and you think that you know you're seeing um, a, a child or an 18 year old that's living at home still, they maybe don't want their parents to know. So you need to make sure that if you're going to leave them there, it's going to be safe and secure. And if you're not sure, then don't leave them there. Bring them to your clinic or bring them to your home. Um, you can also keep them in a place other than the home, the client's home, or other than your place of practice, as long as, again, you're reasonably sure that they're safe and that you have the client's consent. So if you're going to keep them at your home or at an office in, in, a, in, a, in a hospital where you don't work wherever, you need to make sure of that. Um, so we're going to move, so we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about security. Um, you need to keep your records secure in terms of unauthorized access, deletion, transfer, destruction, disclosure, and theft. Um, even if you keep your records in your car and someone breaks into your car and your records are stolen, just because you didn't, that wasn't your fault that you had your car broken into, you would be dinged by the privacy commissioner and prob probably the college if you just left your record sitting in the front seat. So due diligence, um, it, you'll still be responsible for that. The types of safeguards that you need are administrative, technical, and physical. And administrative, um, administrative uh, safeguards include um, using internal passwords, having your facility policies in order, training your staff on privacy, on the need for privacy, et cetera. Technical would be things like encryption, having secure servers, firewalls, using USB sticks that are locked, et cetera. And physical safeguards include locking cabinets and doors, and this includes in transport. So if you're transporting records between your house and the clinic, that you should be having them in a locked case in the locked trunk of your car. So, you know, locked upon locked upon locked. And again, we did speak to you can keep records in a client's home. And I'll let John um, cut in here, talk about how he keeps his records safe. Um, and he's going to talk about also how he keeps his records safe both in his clinic and in storage. Okay. Um. Firstly, in the clinic, uh, we have uh, lockable filing cabinets that are obviously in a clinic that gets locked uh, every night. And so we have the double locking uh, uh, feature there. But I do see a lot of clients in their own homes as well. And uh, as Kara was mentioning, you do have to really keep, uh, keep in mind the fact that you're carrying around somebody's health information with you. And so uh, I just minimize the amount that I do carry around. I only carry around, hopefully, if I only, uh, or if I could make it back to either my home office or my clinic after my individual client, I'll only bring that person's um, file with me. Now, over the years, you develop, you, know, you, you see a lot of people and you have a lot of files that um, are, are uh, of, of clients that have been discharged. And so I do have a separate secondary storage unit that, uh, you know, it's, you see them all around the place, the self-storage places. Uh, in, in my case, it's 24-hour security uh, web uh, or 24-hour video surveillance. Uh, you have to enter using a secure uh, code or by swiping a key. And then once you get into the actual physical building, you then have a padlock on your unit, which then when you get into, you have a uh, hopefully a lockable uh, filing cabinet. So multiple. Uh, safeguards in place, and um, that's kind of that's how I, I manage my long-term storage. And we saying that for the for electronic records, you were going to employ a company. Yes, uh, some software. If you're if you're starting to look into the electronic um, medical records, some software like uh, we use Clinic Master at the Orthopedic Therapy Clinic, and we. Um, uh, as part of the larger software program, they are trying to open up the, the ability to use uh, your 
put your client records in there as well. The advantage of that is when you are going and seeing people in various locations, hopefully you'll be able to use a tablet or a, a, a laptop, for example, um, throughout the clinic or, or outside of the clinic, and it'll go straight back to a regular to your own server. Now, my understanding is that it's not going to be kept in a cloud somewhere, and obviously that would be a major kind of business flaw for the company if they were not meeting the BIPA standards, but um, the, the safeguards would still be there in terms of appropriately signing off on your note, on um, the storage of that electronic uh, information and, and maintaining its confidentiality. We're also, you may see other cl uh, clinics opening up the opportunity for uh, clients to kind of enter into the clinic's website through some kind of client portal and they'll be able to see things like their appointment history and other other information that might be prescribed exercises or other treatments that they've received. And so it's going to be an exciting, interesting time coming up as, as a lot of companies start to make this available to us. Yeah, I, and I know lots of people have had questions about um, Dropbox and, and whatnot. Um, you can contact the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. They will possibly have more technical expertise, and they may have um, they may have some information on what are acceptable software platforms and what aren't. Um, it is permissible to have you know it would be good if you're for your clinic to have an IT person come in and assess your systems as well, and to make sure that they and give them the requirements that you have, and they can make sure that they that they meet those requirements. Um, your safeguards must be reasonable, and again, I know that term doesn't help a lot of people. It's a, kind of a, a, one of those legal terms that we use, and reasonable is defined as what would be um, reasonable in the eyes of an objective person looking at all the circumstances. And I know that we hear a lot about breaches um, in the news, and it makes us all very anxious. You know, it, it, we're not asking you to you know, have the, create a system like the Pentagon and have it an impenetrable fort, uh, fortress. Uh, you know, you, you can't protect against, you know, you, we're not asking you to protect against the, the underground syndicate of the world's best hackers um, that are hell-bent on getting personal information because there's probably nothing that we can, or very little that we can do to stop them. Stop them. So it's what's reasonable. It, like those things, like don't just put the record in your car and lock your car. Put it in a locked valise and put it in a locked trunk and then lock your car. And maybe don't leave your car in a really sketchy parking lot while you go to see your client. So reasonable. Okay, we don't expect you to go to crazy lengths to protect. Um, and reasonable is also dependent on your practice setting, the types of risks that you might face, the size of your staff. So, you know, risk will risk of breaches depends on, on very much where your setting is. So if you see clients in an area of town that is known to have car break-ins, maybe you need to, to think about that. Think about, well, is there a way for me not to have to transport my records? Um, but then again, maybe their house is insecure because maybe they have lots of break-ins. So you have, to, you have to look at it each and every time, different scenarios. And again, ask the people around you. Call the college. Call the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. Um, if you do, and, and safeguards must be monitored. Okay, they're no good if you put them if you put them in place and then never look at them. Never make sure that your staff are following protocols. That you don't change the passwords every once in a while. That there's been a technological advance and. Um, you know, you need to get up to date on that. So you need to monitor, and that's the role of the HIC. If there is a breach, uh, let's say you leave a file somewhere, um, report it. If you're an agent, if you're an employee, the best thing to do is report it to the HIC. So if one of John's employees leaves a file in a coffee shop, they should go and tell John immediately. Um, and then probably best for the HIC then to report it to the client immediately. And let the client know that they have the right to complain to the privacy commissioner or to the college. And also explain any steps you've done to mitigate it. Like, you know, if you you know, if you left them in a coffee shop and you went back two hours later and it was still there, then you know you've taken the record back. But you left it there for two hours. So 
or someone may have looked into it. So you can tell them, look, I, I left your file. Um, I have been able to retrieve it. However, I can't guarantee you that someone did not come in and look at it. Um, and then maybe also explain to them what you're going to do to try to prevent it in the future. Uh, the best thing to be is to be open and transparent and accountable to the clients about any breaches because it's when you're not and when you try to hide it that you're probably at risk for a complaint more than if you admit it up front. Talk about public areas, uh, cards in public areas, like for example, Jim. Sure. Um, we were talking about um, if you are working in a, and this is a common question that I do get, if you're working in a gym as a regulated kinesiologist, but maybe the people around you aren't regulated and the gym itself is not a facility, it's on HIC, um, you would then kind of be the HIC if you're the only regulated health professional and you are required to keep your record secure. So you either have to approach your facility owner and say, these are the requirements that I need. Are you able to accommodate them? If they say no, then you have to look at maybe instituting something in your home. Um, if it's things like at a gym and you have exercise cards for your clients, then that might be OK to hand those over to the client and say, this is yours for your use, and you can leave them here. But anything else, like your notes about your assessments, you know, your soap notes or whatnot, you would want to keep those, those private, because they might contain even more uh, intimate information about the client. OK, so we're going to move on to the last principle, which is records must be confidential. And at the beginning slide, I did put the last principle was confidential. And I said, records must be confidential except where. And this is the thing, is that they're, that's your starting premise. Records must be confidential. They cannot be disclosed without express or implied consent. But then there's a, there are a lot of exceptions to that. The most common exception that you'll be dealing with is to another regulated health professional for the provision of health care. So if you want to go and talk to the client's physician about a diagnosis, you can call that doctor and you can share information between you. Um, that's, you're actually acting kind of on an, on an implied consent uh, indication there. So that's one of the biggest ones that you can, that you can do. There is something called a lockbox. Um, some of you might be uh, aware of what a lockbox is. A lockbox is where a client tells you something and then says, but don't tell this other practitioner. When that happens, and if that happens, you need to say to the client what the dangers are of having a lockbox, because it, that may cause them harm if, if one practitioner doesn't know that they're experiencing something. That, that, that might alter the treatment. So you need to tell them that. If they still want to have a lockbox, you have to let the other practitioner know that there's the existence of a lockbox, but not let them know what's in the lockbox. So you would indicate to, the, let's say, a physician, the client has told me something they don't want to tell you, but you don't tell them what it is. So there's some, um, because generally we don't want clients to do that. We want them to be open about their health. Um, if there's a risk of harm, you can, dis you can disclose without consent. Um, so for instance, if, if, a, if a client said something like, I, you know, I think I'm going to commit suicide tonight, but don't tell my psychologist, and you can think, well, if they're seeing a psychologist, that might be pertinent, that's a risk of harm. You can negate that lockbox and tell the psychologist. Um, and then there's lots of other exceptions that are, are listed after Section 38 in the Act. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but some of them are if you're developing programs, if you're giving them to a researcher and that researcher has met all their obligations um, to determine funding or to contact a substitute decision maker, um, or if there's a purpose of legal proceedings, so if your records are summons. Uh, I wanted to also note with confidentiality and disclosure, that just because you may be able to disclose under one of these exceptions without consent doesn't mean that you should, you know, or that you just do it right away. If you can get consent, you should always try to get consent. Um, you know, obviously, if, it's, if a client has passed out in front of you and they can't 
speak, well then, yeah, go and do what you need to do. But, you know, I'm just trying to say that it's really, really important. And if you can try to get it, get it. If you don't and you need to disclose without consent, then you can do that. Um, and if you disclose without consent, you know, let the person know as soon as possible thereafter that, that, you, that you did that. Um, and that, you know, might really help. So even with, the accept, even with the first one where you can disclose to another regulated health professional, lots of clients don't know what a lockbox is. So it's sometimes still good to say, you know what, I'm going to go back to your physician and, and talk to them about this. Um, that might let the client be able to say to you, well, you know, I don't really want my physician knowing that. Uh, so they may not they may not be aware. It's also made a great point there. Yeah. Okay. So we had a, we have a question about risk of harm to others, risk risk of harm to self. It's any type of of risk to anybody, whether it's um, you know that they disclose a risk to themselves, whether they say they're going to harm someone else, or even if they say they're going to harm harm you. Um, that that can be uh, that can be disclosed. Um, you can also disclose to colleges, and in some cases you have to. So if there's an investigation and the college requests your records, you have to give them over. Um, colleges have their own duties within their own framework to keep records confidential. You also have man you have mandatory reporting obligations. So if a client comes to you and says, "My uh, my physician sexually abused me." You have to report that, um, and you can look for guidelines on that in our mandatory reporting guidelines. So there are there are lots of exceptions to this. Okay, so that that is it for the for the slides. Um, we have a couple of FAQs that I often get, but I'm just records prior to regulation. Okay, so we have a question. Um, from Dagmara, what do we do with records we have already done prior to registration that may be missing some aspects, signatures, other details? Do we have to modify them or continue forward with proper documentation? Um, you know, technically speaking, if you technically speaking, if you get a complaint about your conduct or your record keeping prior to April 1st, 2013, we don't have jurisdiction unless it's continuing. Um, however, if you can fix your record, I would. Um, and I would, I would go back and make sure that, you know, you can identify who made entries and um, look, look back on that. So just because technically there's a jurisdictional issue, um, I would go back and review and then make sure going forward that you do have all those um, protocols into, into place. So especially if it's something big, especially if it's, you know, you, you weren't signing your records or, or something like that, I would go back and, and look at all your records. Um, probably don't expect you to go back over 10 years, but I think it would be a best practice to do so. Um, so we're just looking at some questions here. Uh, there's a question about proper disposal after um, after 10 years. So basically, what PHIPAA states, states is that you have to dispose of records that maintain confidentiality. So don't just put them in a garbage bag and throw them in the back alley. Uh, the recommendation is to have them cross shredded or, or other methods like that with electronic. Uh, records, you probably have to seek the assistance of an IT person because we all know that just because you delete something on your computer, it can still be in there in different ways that I don't pretend to understand. So with electronic records, I would definitely get the assistance of an IT person to make sure that they are eliminated completely from the system. Um, also a good, uh, rec a good best practice is even if you're destroying records after 10 years, keep a database of the records that you've destroyed. So use that unique client identifier and maybe leave some basic information, who the client was, some identif identifying info, and possibly the, the length of their treatment. So the first day you saw them to the last day you saw them. And then note the date that the record was destroyed. 
Um, any records that you potentially think might be needed after 10 years, like if there's litigation going on, don't destroy those records. Keep them. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Christine. If you work in a gym with several other kinesiologists, can we keep a group list for equipment records? How extensive do equipment records need to be, and how often do we need to go through the list? Um, this may be, I may leave this up to the interpretive guide that, we're work, that I'm working on with the five other colleges, um, because this is something that differs a little bit. Um, the, none of the standards say what needs to be in the record, just that they need to be kept for any piece of equipment that could affect the efficacy of treatment for the client. Um, and they should be kept for a minimum five years, if not up to 10 years. Usually what you would want to follow is the manufacturer's um, recommendations on how often something needs to get serviced. However, if you're using something a lot, then you may need you need to get it service appropriate to the level of usage that you're doing it. I'm not sure the details of that question. Sorry, so, um, so we're just looking over some questions to make sure that we can get to many. Okay, we have a we have a question from so we'll go we'll go to the FAQs because we have a question that seems similar to the first question on the FAQs, which is what if I teach classes where patient clients are participating? Um, we get this a lot. People working like people maybe teaching a yoga class in a gym or they're teaching a falls prevention class in a long term care facility. If if you're if you're doing a class, you don't need to keep records for every person in that class because you may not be engaged in a client relationship with them. However, if you are doing a class and you have clients that are in that class and you know what their condition is um, and you note that maybe they're doing something wrong because you know what their symptomology is, you may have more of a duty to uh, intervene, and you may want to then go back and document in their record. Uh, they did do my yoga class today. Um, I noticed that they were doing this not correctly. Please, and then make a note to yourself to follow up the next time that they come in to see you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So you do have a little bit more um, responsibility and accountability to that person that's in your class that you know on that individual client level. Um, we have a question on do I need to chart every time I see a client or just if there's a change in their condition? I'll let John answer this one. You do need to chart every single time um, because you have to identify that you're seeing uh, the client on, you know, you've identified the dates that you're seeing the client and, um, and making appropriate notes during every single appointment. Uh, but the, the focus is on appropriate notes, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit down and write a small novel every single time, because it can get really arduous. Uh, the different, the issue with uh, changes in their condition uh, really reflect back to using the assessment or the A, at least in terms of, uh, in the way that I use uh, soap notes, uh, in terms of the the assessment. So. If, if person comes in, they've got a whole bunch of new uh, symptoms and they do a completely different evaluation, that might change the way that we move forward. And so therefore, uh, we'll make those necessary changes in, in the notes as well. Okay. Um, it's, we're going to have to close off the session soon because it is 125. Um, we'll answer a couple more here. Um, I'd like to just remind or just mention everybody that the webinar will be posted on our, our YouTube channel afterwards. So you can go back and reference and we will be putting up an FAQ, um, you know, common FAQs from this session and tonight's session and providing you some more information. Um, we do have a question um, about if you are an agent. 
Am I responsible for destroying my records um, if, if you leave the company? No, basically. Um, you're an agent. The HIC has the custody and control of those records. And when you leave, you leave those records with them. And the HIC is responsible. So if you are employed at, in the University Health Network and then you move and to sick kids, in, within the hospital setting, you are not responsible for those for those records. They stay with the HIC. Um, I will answer the last question on the FAQs. Oh, there is, so I'll answer one one more question on here. Do I have to record notes for phone calls? I'm assuming uh, this question is from Renee that you mean phone calls with the client. Um, if the phone call is just about the upcoming appointment to remind them to bring something, probably not. But if they're calling you to tell you that there's been a change in their condition, then yes, because then you're, you might be providing treatment. So you want to record. Whatever the medium is, you need to record. So I would say yes to that one. Um, so the last question on the FAQ on the slide is, Am I an HIC if I work in a multidisciplinary clinic? This is a common question that we get. So if you're, you're not an employee, but you're not necessarily the owner, and you're, being, you're, you're kind of contracting in, you're kind of almost renting a space, if you will, um, that's something that you need to work out with the people that you're working with and to bring back to those principles and why we keep records. Um, it, you may be able to come up with a contract agreement and designate one person as the HIC instead of having each and every person be an HIC, particularly if one client is coming in and seeing a chiropractor and the physio and the kinesiologist. Is it, is it best for the, and remember the client's best interest, is it best for them that they have three different records in all different places? What if they come and make an access request and they want their whole record? It's really inconvenient for them if they have to go to three different individuals. So you want to think about those principles, and you want to work together with your team to you know, really try to get one person who is going to be the HIC, and then make sure all the policies and protocols are in place. And with respect to whether or not it's going to be one whole chart, um, again, that's something that you can work out with, whether you keep your own chart and the physiotherapist keeps their own chart, and the chiropractor keeps their own chart. Again, that may be something you, you want to work out. It, and I think the best thing to think about is those principles, why you're keeping records, and the client's best interest. If the client is seeing three different professionals but for one problem, remember that you're trying to tell a story. So does it help to have records in all different places? Or is it better to institute a system where there's one central chart, and everybody can chart in there and make the record, make the entry uh, identifiable to that person. OK, so I, we have a couple more minutes. We'll just review any questions. What was the name of So just a reminder that this is a recorded session. It will be up on the up on uh, YouTube along with the slides. And again, you can you can contact me at any time. My email. Do you want to go to the last slide, Ryan? You can you can contact me. But again, also remember if you have questions, ask your ask your colleagues, ask people around you as well. And like I said, I remember to go back to those principles. Go back to the why. And lots of times you'll, your, your questions will be answered. And uh, you can always read PHIPAA if you really, really want to. <laughs> if you have trouble sleeping, I recommend uh, nestling into bed with it at about 9 PM. OK, well, I want to thank everybody for their time today. I think it's great the level of engagement that we have in these webinars. We hope that it's been useful for you and that you've had a few questions answered or that you know where to get your questions answered in the future. And we will be, uh, like I said, we will be providing you with some more resources shortly. So I, again, thank you everybody for showing up. And we will, we will be letting you know and we'll be doing another webinar. Thank you.